Death, Sex, and Money is supported by Spotify. There's always something new to discover on Spotify, including the world's most popular podcast today. Just open the app, tap Browse, and dive into their growing library. Podcasts on Spotify are streaming right now, including Death, Sex, and Money. Go check it out. I mean, it definitely was there that, like, this is obviously going to affect our relationship romantically, but... I also remember, like, if this entire relationship, like, goes to crap because of this, then, like, whatever. A person has a kidney. This is Death, Sex, and Money. I failed in life. The show from WNYC about the things we think about a lot. So now I'm crazy because I don't love you, right? Is that the point? And need to talk about more. A dollar! I've never seen a dollar! Nobody's got a dollar! Let us see the dollar! I'm Anna Sale. Lori Interlicchio had just finished college and moved home when she tried Tinder for the first time. I mainly just wanted to find some more queer women friends on Long Island. You know, it's not always as easy to go out and meet people or, you know, sometimes you're just looking for people to surround yourself with who are kind of like yourself. And it's, you know, it's kind of like a fun toy. It's like shopping for people online. (laughs) (laughs) Laughing along with her there is Alana Duran whom Lori first noticed during those early days on Tinder. Well, I do remember scrolling through Alana's pictures and being like, this girl's really cute. I'm not going to swipe yet because I want to look at her. (laughs) Um, And she seemed funny. She had a cute bio. um, And I remember just thinking that I hope she swiped back on me. And she did. Wait, can you tell them what was on my bio, though? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, she had this joke, and it was... um, A Mexican magician. A Mexican magician said, I'm going to disappear on the count of three. And he said, uno, dos, and he disappeared without a trace. And I I love that. (laughs) It's so corny, but it works. I like that joke, but I also love that, Alana, you were like, will you tell the joke that I have in my bio? It's really good. (laughs) It was really good. Lori and Alana have been together for two years now. When I talked with them, they were in a studio together in New York while I was in California. When they first met, Lori was 22 years old and living with her parents as she applied to law school. She was not looking for anything serious. Alana was 25, still finishing college on Long Island, and by that point, a tender veteran. I, like, matched with a decent amount of people. You're on the market. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) I was. (laughs) Alana knew how to work it on Tinder. Like Lori, she's very cute, fit-looking. And going on dates with people she'd met online had taught her when to reveal that she actually wasn't very healthy at all. When would you disclose that you were dealing with lupus? Um, Sometimes, like, beginning talking to them, maybe after, like, a week or so, if it would last that long. Or I wouldn't really, I'd I'd kind of say it in passing, like, oh, I had a bunch of health issues, yada, yada, yada. And then when I met with them in person and, you know, we were actually on a date, then I would go into it like a little more detail, um, but not so much to overwhelm them and be like, oh, my God, this is too much for me. Like, let's go, let's go, leave, leave, leave. Lupus is an autoimmune disease with a wide range of symptoms and complications. It disproportionately affects young black women, like Alana, and her case is severe. I still sometimes have a hard time remembering how many surgeries I've had, which sounds funny to regular people. They're like, oh, I just remember I had my wisdom teeth out and, like, you know, my appendix. But for me, it's, it started with a hip infection that led to them taking out my right hip joint Mm. Um, and then months of antibiotics, and then they replaced the hip. I had another surgery to implant my cardiac device. Um, it's a pacemaker slash defibrillator. Mm-hmm. And, like, there had been times when I was in the hospital for months, like literally months. Um, like one year I missed Thanksgiving because I was still in the hospital. Um, like another time I was just totally missed spring. It felt like, you know, it was just summer by the time I got out. Yeah. And when, how old were you when you got the lupus diagnosis? Um, I was 12 when I was diagnosed with lupus. Um, At first they thought it was leukemia um, or some kind of cancer. 
uh, I felt sore um, in places I usually, you know, like my, my joints, my elbows, my hands, my fingers, places that usually didn't hurt for me were starting to hurt and I didn't understand why. When did you first realize that this is something that might kill you? Uh, let's see. Uh, really, the heart, my heart function had dropped towards maybe 10%, 12%. And even then, I thought I was going to be okay. Like, I had faith in myself and in modern medicine that I would be okay. But the doctors and nurses and even my family and friends weren't sure if I was going to make it through the night. And that's really when... You know, after that, when I was like really aware of what was happening, after that is when I really realized that this is something that can kill me. On their first date, Alana told Lori that she had lupus. And then about a week later, Alana told Lori that her kidneys were failing and she was on dialysis to manage it. I had a lot of questions. (laughs) Yeah, Lori definitely did have a lot of questions meeting Alana, you just would never, ever know that she was sick. Uh, So I, you know, I'd never, like, talked to someone about dialysis before. I'm just like, when do you go on it? How long does it take? What does your machine look like? A lot of those kinds of questions um, about her long-term health prospects and, um, you know, needing a kidney. So it's like a whole other dimension of those kinds of really deep conversations you have when you're first connecting with someone that you, you know, are dating. It's yeah. like a, a whole other level of how do you think about your life? Yeah, like I think a lot of people will immediately start asking, like, you know, so what do you want to do in the long term? Or, like, you know, do you want kids at some point? Like, these are things that you want to, like, find out about relatively early on. And I guess part of it is like, hey, if this works out, like, what is our life going to look like, you know? And what did being on dialysis mean for your daily routine? What sorts of restrictions did it put on what you could do and where? So being on dialysis, I did a certain kind of dialysis that I did from home. So pretty much I have this big machine next to my bed, and I would hook it up, and I would do it while I slept. So with that being said, um, nightlife was rather hard. (laughs) I had to be on my machine. My treatment time was 10 hours. So most people don't even get like seven hours of sleep a night. So to be hooked up to machine in my bedroom for 10 hours is like an outrageous amount of time. At the end of their nights together, Alana would hook herself up to her dialysis machine while Lori watched. It didn't scare Lori off like Alana feared. It didn't make Lori think about how it didn't need to be like this. Like, I can be a little impulsive and, like, blurt things out. And I remember, like, almost blurting out, like, you know, I asked her what her blood type, blood type was, and she said, O positive. And I wanted to just blurt out, like, oh, I'm O positive. I wonder if I could donate. And then I stopped myself and was like, that would be a stupid thing to say right now. Like, think about this. <laughs> and I went home, and I, the next day, I, I, like, I couldn't get it out of my mind. I was like, you know, I Googled it, and I was like, maybe this is a thing that I could do. And then I called one of my former roommates Um, who I'm just really close friends with, and I started asking her, like, is this absolutely insane or is this, like, fine? What did your friend say? Um, She was like, wow, that's a lot. But she's a very rational person, and she knows me super well. And she said, like, I think that this is not you just acting on a whim and just doing this because you like her a lot. Like, I think this is something that you would do. And I don't know. It's kind of like a why not, right? Like, I... I don't want to say, what do I have to lose? Because, like, a kidney. But, (laughs) um, (laughs) but, like, it's one that I don't need, right? So that just, like, made sense to me to do that. Um, Like, if another person needs, like, something that you don't need and aren't going to miss, then, like, whatever, right? Why not give it to them? How much time had you spent with Alana when you decided to see if you'd be an eligible donor? Um, Not a lot. So I think this is probably my, probably our third date. I think it was like our third week, maybe. So it was probably like the fourth time we'd actually hung out, probably. Um, And she's on the couch, and that's what I remember, her being on my couch and like, 
kind of asking casually, like, hey, like, do you think I would be able to get tested, see if I'm a kidney match for you? And I think at the time I was literally setting up my dialysis stuff um, Mm -hmm. for the night. Had you told each other you loved each other? No. Yeah, I don't think so. (laughs) <laughs> You're very definite about it. I'm like, I you didn't. Don't I have the so. timeline in my head a little bit. Okay. We had not. When when did that happen? Um, I'm not sure exactly when, but I know that it was after I asked her to be my girlfriend. And this was before I asked her to be my girlfriend. So, wait, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. You hadn't defined yeah. the relationship we had before not you yet discussed the relationship. <laughs> well, that's actually a funny story. So, like, three days later, we were filling out the. Um, initial paperwork that you have to fill out before you go to a, before you get tested to see if you're a match. And there was a a box that said relationship to the recipient. And I wrote girlfriend and I was like, is this okay? (laughs) So that's, that's when we, when we started. Became official. Yes. Yeah. Coming up. They were definitely not thrilled at first. Lori tells her parents that she has a new girlfriend and that she might be giving her a kidney. They hadn't met Alana. They didn't really know I was seeing anyone. Did they think you were being impulsive? Absolutely. Yes, they did. For the past few weeks, you've been sending us your stories about class. I am a millionaire on paper for all the wrong reasons. Dating someone from a different class was a real eye-opener for me. It was common to hear, ooh, be careful, you don't want to end up working at McDonald's. One listener named Julie wrote to us that her dad often bragged about how rich they were when she was growing up. Thinking back on this makes me nauseous, she wrote. Now she works as a hairstylist and says, my husband and I don't have nearly the kind of money my parents had at their age. Another listener says she grew up working class, but isn't anymore. At home, it amazes people that I jog and do yoga. They hate exercise. And a listener named Richard, whose parents immigrated to the U.S. from Colombia, sent in this about himself and his four siblings. We all work hard and fulfilled our parents' dream of what America had to offer, upward mobility. But I think we have lost touch with our humble roots. For the most part, None of us have poor friends, and we tend to socialize with individuals in our income level. It's the week of Thanksgiving, prime time to think about our families and where we come from. And we want to have a broader sense of how you all view yourselves when it comes to class and your families. So we're doing a one-question survey about whether you think you're in the same class as your parents or in a higher or lower one. To do the survey, just text the word CLASS to the number 70101. Again, the word CLASS to 70101 to join in. We'll share all the results with you. And keep sending in your emails and voice memos about CLASS and the moments when you felt your CLASS status the most. Send your stories to us at CLASS at DeathSexMoney.org. On the next episode, actor Gabrielle Union. She and I sat down to talk about sexual assault, splitting time between white and black neighborhoods when she was growing up, and what she and her husband, NBA player Dwayne Wade, like to do for fun. The things that make us the happiest have turned out to be the cheapest things, like taking a football to the park and challenging other couples randomly. It's a really good time. (laughs) Except there's the emotional pain and toll of the other couple. Death, Sex, and Money is supported by Spotify. There's always something new to discover on Spotify. And with a mix of originals and many of the world's most popular podcasts, listening to shows on Spotify is easy. Just open the app, tap browse, and dive into their growing library. Subscribe to your favorites, including our entire archive, so you'll never miss a show. You can also download podcasts for those moments when you're up in the air or going underground. Podcasts on Spotify are streaming right now. Go check them out. Hey, podcast listeners, there's a new podcast coming from WNYC Studios, and it's for kids. Wow, I can hear my voice through the headphones. This podcast has fleas, tells the story of a dog and a cat who live in the same house but have competing podcasts. Cat lovers, this is live from the litter box, coming at you with a show so hot and 
just might explode. This podcast has fleas. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. This is Death, Sex, and Money from WNYC. I'm Anna Sale. It was unusual for Alana Duran to get offered a kidney in the first weeks of dating someone from Tinder. But it wasn't the first time that someone in her life had talked about getting tested. She knew not to get her hopes up. I would get a lot of, like what Lori was saying before, how she wanted to blurt it out. Like, oh, I'm O positive. Like, I could probably get tested. I got a lot of that, but with no follow through. And, you know, they just, like, shout it out and don't really mean it. There's no meaning behind it. Uh, So that was fucking annoying, (laughs) not going to lie. But most of my family did get tested. I'm pretty sure, like, a few other friends got tested, and none of them were a match. Um, But then I have, like, you know, just, like, friends who didn't get tested. And, you know, I don't expect anybody to do that because that's a lot to do and ask of someone. So I think really I was just more annoyed with the people who blurted it out and didn't mean it. Alana did know that Lori had started the testing process, but then Lori stopped bringing it up. So I kind of stopped asking about it because I thought, well, you know, maybe she didn't want to get tested anymore. Or maybe she isn't a match and she just, you know, doesn't want to tell me or she kind of just dropped the whole thing altogether. Lori hadn't dropped it, but she didn't want to get Alana's hopes up unless she knew she could really be a donor. And Lori needed to tell her parents. That they were not thrilled about. (laughs) Did that make you feel, like, defensive or, like... Oh, yeah, yeah. I felt defensive, and uh, we argued for, like, a couple days, actually, and... um, And they were just scared. You know, that's all it is, is that they were scared because they love me and I love them. So I appreciate that they were scared. But, you know, my my parents were freaked out. They didn't even know this person. And I was thinking about having major surgery for her. (laughs) You hadn't introduced Alana to them? No, I hadn't told them about Alana. (laughs) So I kind of just did all of that in one conversation. And then I, I needed medical history from them. So that's kind of why I asked them this stuff, and then I went for the first doctor's appointment. And then about two weeks later, I found out that I was a match, and I told them that, and they were, again, still really freaked out. But Lori had made up her mind. And after a series of follow-up appointments with doctors, it was time to tell Alana. Um, she was supposed to meet me at my apartment so we could go on a date, and she's late per usual. And I'm like, where is she? Oh, my God. So she comes into my apartment. And then on the table, there's a box with my name on it. And she says, oh, I got you something. Lori got out her phone and recorded Alana, unwrapping this box full of treats. So I open the box, and it's all of my favorite stuff, my favorite candy, things that I think are cute. Ooh, Star Wars. Is this why you asked for, like, Star Wars? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and, and you know, I didn't You're know not, not. that at the bottom okay. of the box was going to be... I'm making you choose between me and that damn dialysis machine. <laughs> no matter what, you'll always have a piece of me. Tattoos are overrated. Let's get matching scars. <gasps> no way. Oh, my God. They both posted this video on Facebook, and it got shared a lot. First by people they knew, then strangers. A filmmaker reached out to ask if she could follow them as they went through the transplant process. So there were cameras there on the day, weeks later, when Lori and Alana both went into surgery. Love you so much, sweetheart. I love you, Mama. It took place early on a winter morning. Both their families were there. Alana and Lori had known each other for four months. It was the best gift ever. You know that, right? They were wheeled into surgical rooms right next to each other. Surgeons removed Lori's left kidney, walked into the next room, and put it into Alana. Alana, you have a new kidney. And then Lori and Alana waited. 
together to see if Alana's body would accept Lori's kidney. My main concern was that we were going to come out of the surgery and find out that the whole thing was was for nothing and that I couldn't help her. And just um, tell me about tell me about when you're in recovery and you learn that the kidney is working inside Alana's body, Lori. What was that like? Um, it was just like a flood of relief. Yeah, I just didn't feel like I could really rest until I knew that. And when I knew that, like it just it all it was just all so worth it. Alana, what's changed in your life now that you have a functioning kidney? Well, for the most part, one, I do have a functioning kidney, and I can actually pee before on dialysis. I, like, would not pee at all. So you just kind of stop peeing when you're on dialysis? Yeah, for the most part. Maybe I didn't know go, that. like, once a day and, or, like, twice a day, like, once in the morning and, like, try to go once before bed. But, like, it was unproductive pee. That's what I'd call it, an unproductive <laughs> pee. I felt like I had to go, but I couldn't. Um, so that was the biggest change, like, immediate change for me. Do you feel like... Oh, right. Sorry. The most important... Oh, most important part. Sorry. Lori was motioning at me that oh. it also increased my heart function, her kidney. Oh, that is important. So, <laughs> yeah. remember when I said I was... At the time, I was when it was really bad, it was at 10%. Um, but then after that, it increased, I think, to 40 And then the last echocardiogram I had was 62%, which is normal. So I now have a normal heart function thanks to Lori's kidney. Sorry, I didn't want to toot my own horn there, but I was like, yeah, that's a pretty significant one to leave out. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I think you've earned some tooting, Lori. (laughs) Toot away. (laughs) Thanks. You're in a long-term relationship together. You were in the early part of that relationship when you went through this really intense thing. Like, do you remember the first time, do you remember the first time you got mad at each other after the surgery? I really don't, I don't know. No. Like there, like, I think that for at least three months, we were just like so happy that everything went well. There was no fighting. And then, yeah, I feel like it must've been in the summer at least. Several months afterwards. Yeah. Oh, it might have been when I called Alana and told her I was going to move to Michigan. <laughs> so she called me, and she always prefaced, like, something bad. It's like, okay, don't get mad at me. Or, like, okay, I have some bad news, but, like, it's not my fault. Or, you know, something like that. Um, and she's like, I had accepted into University of Michigan Law School. And I was like, wow, that's great. But now you're leaving, and I still have another year of school left. And, like, I can't. I can't, I can't leave and go with you. I wasn't mad, per se. I was just like, what? Like, already? It was like the first tension. And this is still just a few months after your surgeries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, she was great and she was supportive, but I think that she was scared and maybe a little bit annoyed. Like, I don't know if I want to move to Michigan in a year, right? So it just kind of added an element. Lori, was there a part of you that worried about leaving Alana? Definitely. Yeah, I mean, like, I totally trust that she has, like, such a great support system. But, yeah, I was worried that she would have to go to the hospital at some point. Um, That happened, like, immediately after the surgery. There was, like, a night where we had to, you know, Alana had to go to the hospital and get the kidney checked on because she was not doing well. And I definitely worried, at least for the first few months, that that could just happen at any time. I know that, like, right now Alana's doing really well health-wise, but I also know that that could just change at any time. Um, And, like, I'm definitely super, like, willing to always take care of her, but I think that that's, like, something that always is just in the back of my head a little bit is that, like, one day she could get sick again. And that that's, if she does, that'll be a big part of our lives. How How do you talk about, like the power dynamic in your relationship. I think in any relationship, there's there's a, a, a partner who might be more needy in a moment and another who can give more, and sometimes that shifts back and forth. You all have had a very extreme example of that. How, how have you talked about that? I think that Lori did a really good job um, starting the conversation 
So Lori said something like, you know, even though I'm giving you a kidney, it, you know, we don't have to stay together. If you want to break up, you can break up. Like, you don't have to stay with me because I gave you a kidney. Um, and that was really nice to hear. I mean, I wasn't planning on breaking up with her. But to know that, you know, because, like, I don't know how to explain it. Someone gave me a p- literal piece of them. Like, what? Like, you know, I can't repay them for that. Um, so, like, kind of in my mind, I was thinking, like, oh, you know, I can't break up with Lori because she gave me a kidney. That would be terrible. People would be really, really mad at me. Yeah, and it's like, a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. exactly. There's a lot of pressure there. And, like, having Lori come in and say, hey, you know, if you need to break up with me because it's not working, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Like, obviously, it's going to suck. But just because I gave you a kidney does not mean you have to stay with me forever. Do you think that's true? That even though it's something that's been said, that you would find, like, that that's something that you could you could do? Lori, I didn't want you to find out this way. But... <laughs> 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 no, no. I mean, it's. I think it's true. I mean, I we haven't put it to the test. Um, but I think if I needed to, I would be able to. What about you? I mean, Alana can definitely break up with me. My mom pointed that out, like, super early on to me, that, like, this is maybe not the best thing for a brand new relationship. And uh, Alana and I talked about it immediately. We talked about it before... Um, the surgery, like far before the surgery. Yeah. And like, I remember even saying, if you want to break up with me before the surgery, like this is brand new. If you like, you're cool and we can be friends and it doesn't have to be like, that's not why I'm doing it. So, I mean, I hope that she knows that she can break up with me. Like, I mean, I, I don't want her to break up with me ever, but like, if it happens, like it will be treated like a normal breakup. That's Lori Interlicchio and Alana Duran. Alana moved up to Michigan earlier this fall to live with Lori. She's currently volunteering at a neurology lab at the University of Michigan. Lori is midway through her second year of law school. And a few days after we talked, they got a puppy together. The documentary about Lori and Alana and the kidney they've shared is called Bean. It's currently playing at film festivals around the country, and there's a link to it on our website at deathsexmoney.org. Death, Sex, and Money is a listener-supported production of WNYC Studios in New York. I'm based at the Center for Investigative Reporting in Emeryville, California. Our team includes Katie Bishop, Annabelle Bacon, Katie Bishop, Annabelle Bacon, 